Hey there, I guess, hey Rick, and hello to the rest of you. Um, we want to welcome you to our Wednesday event series. I feel like now we might officially be able to call it a series. Definitely. It's okay. Like so, I'm Ann Merchant, and I work for the National Academy of Sciences. I'm Rick Lovard. I work for the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a program of the National Academy of Sciences. And so we hope that you are, first of all, we want to say that we hope all of you are well. Um, I know that uh, it's probably making everybody a little stir crazy to be at home. We hope that maybe by offering some Wednesday programming, some giving you some science fix, um, that that s sends a little um, something extra into your day. I've been doing things. I was watching a, a humming chorus from the uh, Kennedy Center. I was also watching Stanley Tucci make a Negroni, which I thought was actually rather fun. I was doing it during the day, so I was not drinking the Negroni along with him. And then I was watching some live streaming from the National Aquarium. So it's kind of amazing what you can be doing. So I hope that we um, offer some similar fun programming in the middle of all that. So. Um, I also feel like, uh, you know, we've been doing some uh, polling after our events and asking how many people have been coming regularly to Science and Entertainment Exchange events or National Academy of Sciences events. Um, and I think most of you probably know a little bit about the National Academy of Sciences, but I always feel like it's my job to, to kind of give the, um, the, the song and dance about the institution. So I will start by simply saying that the National Academy of Sciences is a private nonprofit institution in Washington, DC. Um, I am of course not at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, I'm sitting in my home and hoping that dogs are not gonna bark or that nobody runs in to ask me for something. Um, but the Academy has been around for more than 150 years, um, created by Abraham Lincoln, um, pretty much built for times like this. But we have a long history of impacts, whether it means that um, we have a recent study on forensic science so that we could clarify what we know and what we don't know um, about the state of forensic science. Um, we've done things, we, we, we ended the reading war. We probably didn't even know there was a reading war, but we have said that it is both whole language and phonics, it's some of both. Um, we also, put an end essentially to the use of chimpanzees in primary research because it's not necessary to use them as an animal model. And so there are a lot of different ways that the academies has impact. Um, and we right now have a standing committee that is giving good advice on the pandemic. Um, and we've been, I think we've issued I think there's been about a dozen of these rapid expert consultations that are on our website if you're interested in looking at those. Um, and so the Academy has been very, very active during this period in the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, we have small contributions that we can make through the event series that we offer. Um, and, and the Science and Entertainment Exchange is a part of that. And I'm going to turn it over to Rick to explain, because I think we did have somebody last time who had typed in the chat window, I don't understand why you're talking about the entertainment industry. Um, but it, it does, it all connects to, through the Science and Entertainment Exchange. And I'm going to let Rick explain that. Yep. So, um... I'm Rick Lovert. I'm the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange. About 10 years ago, the National Academy of Sciences looked across the media landscape and thought, you know, there should really be a bridge between STEM professionals and the entertainment community in an effort to get more and better science into feature films, TV shows, and video games. We work from a, a model of inspiration, not necessarily fact checking. We're really just trying to get people engaged and interested in science. Usually the programming that you see, the type of programming that you're going to see today uh, is for a very select group of people in Hollywood. Uh, but you know what? Uh, with unusual times come amazing opportunities. And so here we are uh, able to open up programming uh, virtually. And so we're hoping to do this now forever, I think. Forever is the time. Um, and so I just want to thank a couple of people really quickly. Uh, the AV team at NAS that makes this happen. Moises, thank you. Uh, Courtney, Jeff, and Sachi, that's our team uh, behind the scenes making these events happening. Emily Lordich, who will be live tweeting the event. Davis Mastin, without you, this event literally would not have happened. So thank you for actually putting us in touch with Jack to get the whole thing started. Um, and uh, so basically what the Science and Entertainment Exchange is really quickly, it's a hotline for uh, if you're a creative person in Hollywood, writer, producer, studio executive, you have a question about science as you're making a feature film, TV show, or video game, 
you can call us and we will connect you to a field expert. If you're new to uh, our events and you are a field expert, we are always, always, always looking for volunteers. So please, please, please give us a call or an email and uh, we would love to have you in our database of experts to connect with Hollywood folks. We've done over 3,000 consults, films like Avengers Infinity War, Man of Steel, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, you know, big Hollywood movies. Um, and lastly, I would be remiss if I did not uh, thank our sponsors, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, without whom this event today would not be happening. Uh, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Walt Disney Company, Film Nation, Google, Lida Hill Foundation, Corteva, and individual donors. If you did, we know this event's free. We're keeping this event free for anybody who wants to see it for free within our uh, bandwidth. Uh, but uh, if you did give, thank you. It's helping us do more of these events and improve them. And then finally, one last thing. If you have a question for one of the speakers during the event, down here, there should be a thing that says Q&A with a little like thought bubble kind of deal. Click on that. I'll be looking at it and I'm gonna be moderating the Q&A. So I'm gonna be flagging questions from that to ask of our speakers. And you can ask a question at any time. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Anne. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Um, you know, so it's interesting about, gosh, I don't know how many years ago it was, but again, um, through the, the, the um, auspices of Davis Maston, and I hope you're out there, Davis, because we're talking about you. Um, we were introduced to Esri and it was very interesting because I, I knew something about um, what GIS was and I had an appreciation for how complex and meaningful mapping was. Uh, but when we decided to bring this event to our entertainment community in Los Angeles, the first response we got was, I'm not sure that that will be interesting. Maps, I don't know. That doesn't sound very interesting. Um, but within a very short period of time, our entertainment community was deeply, deeply engaged in the conversation. And I have to say that there were probably about 80 people in the room um, because our in-person room is much smaller than our virtual room. Um, I don't think anybody left that room who was not unmoved by what mapping really does. That, that to see the world through new lenses and to have an appreciation for patterns in a way that, that only mapping can make clear was something that was, I mean, I, I was going to say eye-opening, I mean, both literally and figuratively, but it was sort of a shift in, a, in, in I think everyone's understanding of what that means. So we're going to play a short video that gives you a sense of what Esri is in, in sort of big general terms and what they, what they contribute to the science of mapping. But I think that when you hear from our speakers, you're going to understand how poignant this is in this moment and at this time. Um, so we're going to, we're gonna run it, we're gonna turn our cameras off um, so that we can run a short video. When you look at the world, what do you see? Where others see chaos, we see patterns. Connections. Relationships. When you use location technology, you can see where things happen before they happen. With Esri Location Technology, you can see what others can't. So that gives you a sense of what Esri is in a sort of everyday world, but as we all know, we're not living in an everyday world. So we are extremely happy to have Jack Dangermond, who is the founder and the CEO of Esri um, today with us. And he is joined by Esty Garrity, who is the chief medical officer at, at, at Esri. And I think that together they will give you a sense 
of why it is so important that we see the world through new lenses as we try to understand what's happening. So I'm going to turn it over to them and let them take it from here. Hello, everybody. My name is Jack Dangerman, and uh, my colleague here, Esti Guerte, is uh, much smarter than me. She has lots to say, but uh, we're going to be sharing with you some of the work that both ourselves, but even much more importantly, the colleagues that we work with have been doing over the last six weeks using geography and GIS to be able to uh, address some of the challenges. Esti? Yeah, I'm very happy to be with all of you here today. And this has been such a, a busy and uh, difficult, and many have said unprecedented time. Um, and it's also an inspiring time, um, an incredibly innovative time, lots of amazing things going on. And uh, we're pretty excited to share some of the work that we and, and mostly our customers are doing. What I'm gonna do is uh, start off by sharing a set of screens, uh, PowerPoints actually, that describe some of the work. Um, while I'm setting that up here, I do wanna take a, a moment and simply acknowledge all the thousands of people that are working on what we're about to show you. Uh, we've been, Esty and I have been privileged in many ways to see firsthand how people are addressing at the information level and then the analytic level uh, the, the this uh, amazing pandemic. So yes, and also I'd like to acknowledge all of you for taking an interest in uh, both on the academic side and on the entertainment side, because this is this is serious stuff, and the work that these people are doing are, is is extremely important, as you'll see. So uh, I'll start off and asked if I would describe a little bit about Esri. We are a 50-year-old organization. Our main focus is on geography, digital geography. And we take digital geography, you can imagine what it is, and build it into systems that help people make decisions or help um, in various ways. Uh, our organization is a software company. We are a couple billion dollars in size. We have about 350,000 uh, organizations that we support, one of which is uh, CDC, or one of which is FEMA, or one of which is the city of Los Angeles, or uh, like that. So just about every field uses our tools, uh, and we are so much interested in this idea of promoting geography as a way to communicate and as a way to understand and analyze our world. And the coronavirus uh, makes it uh, very clear how very important it is. Geography is the basis of GIS. We'd say it's the basis, it's the geography is the science of our world. And it provides contextual settings, but also rich content. It's also a reference system that you and I can relate with. It helps us see things through visualization, but also through modeling the complexity of our world. It helps us see relationships, patterns, and helps us bring it all together and understand things. And then as we'll see in a moment, intelligently respond. The application yeah. for this, yes. I just, I, I like to stop you on that slide because that idea of content and context, I know it's two words, but they describe everything in my mind. When I first saw you create this slide and read those words, I thought that's the way to describe what we do. The content is all of that data and information, and it's all happening somewhere. Mm -hmm. And on text really brings that perspective together. So if this audience needs to understand one thing, I think that's it. I think it's content and context describes it beautifully. I just wanted right. you to know, I, I love this slide and it's always resonated with me. Me too. And, and people do this in just about every field. Uh, they do it in urban planning in national security and transportation. Um, and particularly in Esty's field, healthcare. It's just uh, opened up the world's eyes to epidemiology and patterns and relationships uh, among what, well, what's going on, what you're reading about in the news. And we'll be talking a lot about that. But uh, let me just back up here and say, demographics, most of you are aware of the census. We're doing it this, uh, this month, actually. Uh, and out of the census, we can have insight into the demographics and patterns of our country. But 
mapping and digital mapping and GIS actually are supporting virtually all of these kinds of applications from homelessness to mosquito control to lead poisoning. So Estes whole world is, is caught up in these kinds of applications. Yep, absolutely. Esty, you must have uh, uh, thousands of customers like uh, big hospitals, uh, the uh, Kaiser, Loma Linda University, Johns Hopkins, CDC, WHO. These are all hospitals and governments um, and in government, it ranges from public health departments to social services. When you think about homelessness and even pharmaceutical companies and health insurance plans, they all need this kind of information. So what, what is GIS actually? It's an information system. Most of you are familiar with accounting systems. This is an information system about geographic stuff, both physical stuff and demographic human geography. It's a system to manage geographic data and then apply it in various ways. And it starts by abstracting what we know, geography, and then it allows us to integrate different parts of geography. Like I like to think of it as integrating different ologies, geology or climatology or sociology or geology. You know, you can bring it all together by digitally abstracting the world and then analyzing those relationships and patterns and processes. This is basic science, but it's also visual and it's something that most people can understand through maps. In the coronavirus, it's been used as an information system. GIS people, a little support team will stand up some layers of data and then they can do surveillance and planning, do logistics, they can do field operations, get reporting in from the field, like what's going on in nursing homes in real time right now. Um, and then it has dashboards associated with it where you can actually see like the uh, Johns Hopkins dashboard that many of you are familiar with. So you can actually track the virus and its spread in real time. And that's very engaging. People can actually look at it like they look at the weather. And this, this community that, uh, that uh, SD and I live in has just jumped up and, start, and started applying their practices of geographic knowledge, collaborating, sharing approaches. It's just a miracle to watch them in action. And I think that's kind of what we wanna share here today is their applications are first helping their organizations, whether it's businesses or government agencies or the society in general, understand or situation awareness. This is the snap of yesterday's uh, Johns Hopkins map, now three, three million people confirmed. And uh, you see it at state levels, dashboards there in cities, in counties. We're running the WHO dashboard up in the upper right. Uh, and it's, it's just intriguing to not only watch the measurements, but also watch the models and their forecasts. Speaking about forecasts, one of the applications is to, is to predict the spread and impact on hospitals. Many of you have been hearing and probably sick of hearing the sort of model, the curve as it's uh, spoken about. These graphics here show this curve. I think this is in, I'm not sure, but I think the one on the left is in California. You can sort of see the dark blue line is with intervention, the light blue line is without intervention, in other words, staying at home. And uh, some of these models, and there are a number of them, are projecting not only the decline this summer, but then another spike next winter. We don't really know altogether, but there are models and theories about this that are pervasive. One of the reasons why these models are so powerful is that they, like on the right slide, you can run through the models and then predict the impaction of the models on, on beds, on, on, on uh, ventilators. On, so you can see on the left slide, no intervention, and you see the growth and it's blowing out hospitals across the country. And on the right, with a more controlled stay at home, uh, it flattens the curve as they say, you can see it here literally. It doesn't mean that the disease doesn't happen, it just happens at a slower rate so that the hospitals are not impacted. I mean, Esty, do you want to say something about these models? Yeah, absolutely. They're, I think they're so critical. Um, and we know that every model is simply that. It's a model. And uh, no model is perfect. 
Um, and I think people should use multiple models to try and figure out what the level of impact is going to be. But it, I think there's the practical approach, which is how you use this information to determine your policies in terms of uh, social distancing restrictions and how you determine what your capacity needs are going to be going forward. Do you need more hospital beds? Do you need more ventilators to deal with uh, the higher curve? But it's also, I think, very personal, right? I mean, I don't want to see a big peaked curve because I know that when that peak exceeds what, what we're able to do in a health system, then people are going to get less optimal care. No, and you've got, uh, you've my got a parent. Middle, northern yeah. Italy situation. So and what's we want unique our family members to have that, that choice made for them. Exactly, Esty. What's unique about this is you see that we are modeling it with parameters, but then spatially allocating the results of the model. That's what's the unique uh, contribution here to with GIS. And these models, which involve analytics of spatial things, are helpful, helpful to understand vulnerable populations, but they're also able to help us understand where best we should respond. Like where should we locate uh, testing sites? And we have a collection of tools called location analytics or location allocation analytics. So where should we locate, let's say in the LA basin, more testing sites if we run out of capacity? Or where should we set up temporary hospitals, which was done by WHO using these tools in Wuhan? Uh, where, where do you do it? Uh, you have to pick the right site. And that involves looking at all the demands and all of the existing locations and then picking the right sites. So these are simply some, some graphics that illustrate the kind of modeling that our users are doing. Users are responding here by standing up what we call an enterprise system. Here we see taking all the case data, the movement data as indicated by cell phones, facility data, that's the hospitals and their capacities, and then the demographics and, uh, and putting it together into a system. And we see the around the clock here, uh, Johns Hopkins, which probably most of you are familiar with uh, is one of the most popular ones, but uh, states, cities, FEMA, the U.S. Defense Department is now looking at capacities and capacitating over capacities in their own internal facilities. There is a, a process that we sometimes refer to as the science of where. Uh, it's really a framework and a process where you measure things, you visualize them on maps, you do analytics, like overlaying these maps as I was showing, then you make plans. Where should we do this? Where should we do that? Or you support decision-making and then take it to action. And this diagram I'm really fond of because it's similar to your nervous system. It's your nervous system observes, senses, and then you're, you cognate, you understand, and then you respond. Uh, with COVID, the idea is we are measuring our capacities and health facilities. We're measuring, of course, the cases coming in the demographics, we're understanding vulnerable populations, some are more vulnerable than others, and we communicate them through maps and we model them and we, and we plan. This is the big question is, you know, do we stay at home a little bit more or do we let more out? We make plans and those are tied up into uh, our capacity of, it's like turning a big dial. How much can we, how, how, how can, well, how, how much capacity is there relative to how much do we let people out? And people don't talk about this very much, but that's what people are really doing. And then they take action. This technology that we work with, GIS, allows you to integrate all kinds of the COVID data, all the types of data, tabular data like cases, the demographics, uh, mobility data, like us moving around in our cell phones, our little cell phones have locators, if we allow it, and that gives us an indication of how much movement is happening uh, when there's intervention requests like our own governor or our, our mayor have done. And then it's the resources, the, uh, the facilities, the social distancing restrictions, that data comes into these systems, gets spatialized, and then the models, which I've already talked about. All this data comes in from different sources. It gets normalized and organized in these overlays of data and then used. It 
So these are apps. You might think of them as apps on your cell phone, but they're also apps like big dashboards, mapping apps, models that show the spread, uh, and then intervention analysis assessments, like uh, are people really staying at home or are they getting out? And then, and then the ability to do surveys, dynamic surveys. I'm being a little repetitive here, so forgive me, but uh, these different graphics help us tell the story of what these amazing people are doing. Esti, maybe you can do it in a, in a more logical way. This is Esti's approach here, how she set it up with processes and workflows to bring this together. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I'm gonna spend a few minutes on this slide talking about that approach. I mean, it was just a few slides ago that Jack showed you how GIS supports entire workflows. So I wanted to take that idea and really bring it to life and see how it all fits together for COVID-19 with a, a use case. Uh, so this is really where you start with mapping the cases and mapping the cases with all of the dashboards that you've seen I mean, that gives you a sense of your current situation, right? We call that situational awareness. What is the current state of affairs? Then as we watch, uh, sadly, the case numbers increase and the spread of the disease happen, maybe that's getting closer to our own communities. That's when we start going into action mode. And that's where we've seen some of the policies on social distancing measures put into place. Now, you know that these social distancing measures uh, vary in their strict strictness, and they also vary, frankly, in the population's adherence to those measures across the country. And so that's why it's really useful to analyze that information through the cell phone data that Jack was talking about to see what's really happening. What kinds of places are people frequenting now? And then we get to the next section, and that is, you know, in public health, we have an obligation to understand vulnerable populations and then mitigate the potential impacts of those vulnerabilities. So what we need to do is develop risk maps for different kinds of risk. There's risk of being exposed to disease, risk of transmitting disease to somebody else, our own personal susceptibility to disease risk, and socioeconomic risk. Now, all of these risks are distributed disproportionately across our communities, and geographic analysis can identify the priority places for the interventions we would want to have. It would basically level the playing field, if you will. Now, the next part of the workflow is to predict how well our various systems can manage those impacts, given the population risks that we just looked at and the population needs that we would forecast. And then the result of that analysis drives how we're going to allocate our resources, like where should I stand up a temporary hospital if I'm going to need that? Where are the ventilators and personal protective equipment going to be needed? How much will be needed and for how long? Will I need to distribute foods in my community to keep people well as, uh, as we continue on in this crisis? Should I sanitize some exterior surfaces or place hand washing stations in the community uh, there are many decisions that can be made, but I hope this uh, shows you how they all work together in a common workflow that you can continually add spatial information to and make better decisions. So, yeah, Jack, that's, that's, back that's to you. That's perfect. That last one is really the big deal. Is, and you hear this by our politicians, political leaders, you know, moving ventilators around or moving people around or building new hospitals or building new testing centers. It's a, it's a spatial thing, actually. And modeling analytics are a big part of that. Uh, being able to look at these patterns in space and time, then looking at the, the uh, response models. I think I've already talked about this, predicting where it's going to grow and then the impaction of that. And then finally, again, being a little repetitive here, picking the right site. It's like picking the right site for a Starbucks or picking the right site for a Walgreens. Or, uh, so our, our common users which are thousands in business or in public sector, they do this all the time, but this is a different kind of application. It's generic site selection. So Jack, you comment on this? Model? Yeah, you know, I think that um, since the folks on this call are interested in science, I think it's important to um, share with them one of my favorite things about geography, and that is the first law of geography which makes spatial analysis different 
in valuable and completely different ways than traditional kinds of statistical analysis. So we start in any spatial analysis with a very different assumption before we do any math. And that assumption is that things that are closer together are more related than things that are further apart. And that one thing changes everything we do. It makes geography interesting. It makes our results relevant to what we do. It helps us to find patterns in our data, like how things cluster together or how dispersed they are, how diseases might spread. So that first law of geography is what makes all of this tremendously interesting and useful. And we, we build these quantitative models that allow us to deal with those. Now, uh, these applications that we've been sharing run on data. So one of the first things that had to be done is the development of a, an information model. And we think of the whole world as layers, you know, <laughs> there's this layer and there's that layer. These are the basic layers that have come to be uh, heavily used and you can glance through them. But you can see in the little diagram on the right, it's basically tabular data linked to geography and then being able to overlay and analyze these geographic phenomena. It's again, back to what SD said, context and content. This is a summary of the process we've been talking about. You need to prepare the data and our users are quite versed in being able to do that all over the world. Then their job has been to understand the risk, then to model the spread, then to monitor social distancing. This has been such a phenomenal thing. I mean, I, I'm dying to share with you one of the observations we've seen so far, which is think of a map where people are moving around. That is, their cell phones are moving around. And I can just say that after the declarations for intervention, people stayed at home more. Uh, and actually they stayed at home in California about 70% more. So we overlaid that map, which is by census tract. Are they moving around in this track or not? We overlaid that on top of demographics because we were interested who is staying home and who is not. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. is it the rich people who are staying home or not? Is it the people who speak English or the Hispanics that don't? Is it the farm workers or is it more the uh, factory workers? Who's staying at home and who's not? So I'd just postulate this question to you before I give you the answer. Who do you think it was? It turns out that almost uniformly across California, this was the first you know, mid-March drop. People stayed at home almost uni uniformly, regardless of class. And okay, there was a few little zip codes here and there. I mean, uh, census tracks where people were jumping out or not, misbehaving, so to speak. But it wasn't organized exactly by class. Now it is changing. We're starting to see some change in that, but not much, which is heartening to me because it says when we have really an emergency, we do, we do tend to take orders and stick together on a, on a cause like this. People got, got the whole picture. Well, I'm off on a detail here. You can look at also, we looked a lot at capacity of hospitals, hospital beds, tracking those as the virus grows up. So the governor has in his face this information. He's able to, and same in Georgia and same in Florida. They're not, not all of them are using it, but uh, at least in this, in this state, we have um, some really enlightened uh, leaders in terms of data-driven and science-driven assessments. And in any political process, it's lots of trade-offs and so they, they, I'd hate to have that job, but at least they do have excellent information. And not at the state level, but at the local level, we're seeing in counties and in cities, this idea of using location and allocation tools to, to drive things forward. Esther, did you want to say anything more about this process that we're seeing? Well, it's, uh, it's, I just think it's very well laid out. It really is logical in the direction that you take and uh, starts where everybody starts with the data and the information model. And I guess the one thing I'd like to say about that is data are more plentiful than they've ever been before. And, and glad you turned to this slide because we've been trying to collect and partner with people who have data and host it so that everybody can use it uh, on this website along with a number of other resources. There's uh, software and analytic tools here. There are blogs and lessons and ways to learn how to do exactly what you need to do 
for COVID-19, all kinds of guidance. Um, so this is, a, and I should say hundreds, if not thousands of examples of what city governments, county governments, national governments around the world are doing to support uh, COVID-19 response in their communities. It's, you could spend days there uh, just exploring the work, but we offer this to you as a resource to go back to and uh, learn what everybody else is working on. Yeah, there's lots of interesting stories here. Uh, there's actually lots of interesting stories that we've watched. First, I'd say not, a, not everything is perfect. Uh, what we have done is we have a normal business and then every time a, an emergency happens, and this is one that's really extraordinary, we open up our company with free software and literally hundreds of people on the phones trying to support our users responding in their work. And that's been interesting to watch. But the normal humanness of people about how they share data, don't share data, uh, we have amazing stories to tell. Uh, and gradually over time, uh, there has been real consensus about these methods that we're showing. But in the beginning, as you would expect, people were going crazy, hair standing on end in various ways. Well, um, I think, Anne, if you don't mind, I think that's, uh, Esty, do you have any last things? Because I think we probably should just open it up for questions. Yeah, I'm seeing there are a number of questions uh, out there. So let's just see what uh, people are asking of us. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, so you, sh you should be able to hear me, not see me right now. Um, one of the first questions um, I wanted to throw to you both are sort of, can you tell us a bit about the people that Esri, with whom Esri uh, interacts and sort of some of the human stories that you've experienced through this uh, crisis? Wow. Well, our customers are just about everywhere and in just about every kind of institution. So WHO is, the World Health Organization is in Geneva. We have supported them with an enterprise system and they have their own sort of uh, uh, vi virus map that they're sharing and they're doing analytics, trying to model uh, like crazy. Uh, the Johns Hopkins University is again, the most popular site. Uh, the Johns Hopkins map when it reached its peak was making 10 billion maps a day on our uh, cloud system. So that, that was interesting. Uh, Almost every state has stood up our software as a hub for communicating what's going on in the state. Um, all the major cities, New York and DC and little cities, uh, a lot of counties, county here in Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, uh, some volunteer and NGO organizations, a lot of academics in the science space. There we're trying to work, especially on some of these models like the, the CHIME model of uh, University of Pennsylvania, which is the one that we've integrated in with our tools and, and others. Uh, and then, Esther, you, you have some, uh, a lot of hospital users that are using it uh, to look at their capacities, hospital systems like Kaiser. Yep, absolutely. Um, that's a great example. Kaiser is, has always been interested in looking at their capacity. Uh, we've been working with Providence St. Joseph Hospital, who, uh, health system, I should say, who's looking at how they spend what is literally billions of dollars per year in community benefit dollars to uh, support the COVID-19 in their communities around their hospitals and trying to make sure they do this in an organized, non-overlapping way. And in fact, they're partnering with Kaiser and Dignity Health and um, Adventist Health to bring all of those systems together. Uh, you may not know this, Jack, they're using uh, hubs as a common communication platform, mm -hmm. just like the hub website that, that we showed the audience here, uh, so that they can share best practices and support in an aligned way the communities that they serve. It's been really inspiring. Well, another way to answer this question is there's different levels of people. I mean, there's governors and they're aware of it. Uh, in, our, in our state, we have a really good governor I mean, in terms of geographic literacy, that's how I ranked him. He's really smart. Uh, he understands and understands maps and works with data-driven stuff. But his staff, you know, they it's, they divided up into different agencies and and coming. Uh, the, the the frank situation is that health agencies versus emergency management agencies versus other agencies are all trying to struggle to get their data to help the problem. Uh, and so you get data sharing and data 
scenarios of frustration in the back offices as people are trying to put these things together. And people are learning new things. They're just, it's not all out of the box. We've had to literally uh, invent it as we're going along because yeah. it's, it's a different kind of approach. I, I think there's, a, you, you're yeah, talking sure. about sort of the top down approach and some of that data driven emphasis by uh, some of our leaders. There's also a bottom up approach. I mean, we've seen some individuals who know GIS and maybe there hadn't been any emphasis in their health department or their government office on creating a map and they create a dashboard and it goes straight to the governor and becomes the thing now that everybody's focused on. So we've kind of seen that push from the individual who has a belief they know they can be of service um, and then the, the top down approach trying to get everybody aligned on the same page. It's been very interesting to watch. It's actually quite overwhelming because you, you see people in all stages of emotional upset. I mean, right, uh, it's, it's uh, touching really to see them. So my, minor point of clarification, um, we, there have been a few references in the conversation to this state and our state, uh, that's California we're talking about. Um, and then, so we have a few questions about uh, how Esri uh, gets data both now and into the future as we're talking about sort of contract contact tracing and trying to keep people safe into the future. Like how do you um, weigh potential privacy concerns with the public good? Well, first off, it's usually not our data, although we have a lot of data that we curate. We're basically tool builders and people pretty much in all the states are using our tools, which we've made available for free to every state uh, to be able to take their own data and pour their own data into it to be able to make their own maps. Uh, there are some aggregators like Johns Hopkins is an act actually an aggregator from counties and cities and states all over the world, uh, countries all over the world to be able to make that map. So they're doing the data integration thing. Uh, what you're actually getting at, I suspect, is this issue, which is a controversial issue about location and personal privacy. And it is a it is a open debate and discussion right now in our field is uh, how much do we let others know about where we are? Because by knowing where you are, you know a lot about you. You, you can overlay the needle all the way down through uh, a bunch of layers and, and characterize your behavior quite uh, intensively. And that's not us. Uh, we, we don't do that sort of thing, but we do link into these providers. One of them is called SafeGraph. One of them is called Blue Dot, and there are others. They actually aggregate cell data from the phone companies uh, like uh, Verizon uh, device companies, and they aggregate it. Uh, they show traces, they, they anonymize it. But uh, it is something that we have to work on as a, as a society, how much locational data do we wanna share? China has, uh, you know, has completely blown privacy open. They, <laughs> you, if you go to China, you know uh, what I'm talking about. You walk in any room, they're photographing you. Your, everything about you is known and they track, uh, track you. So people have suggested, although we're really not sure that the uh, tracking of individuals helped them keep it into a box. Uh, when somebody encountered a disease, uh, other people would be notified uh, who had come into touch and to touch with them. And Apple and Google, you may have read, have created a kind of consortium to be able to get this kind of information and message it out directly. Our world is not so much consumer focused like that. It's largely analytic focused with big data uh, that is more in an aggregate form. So we have not had to hassle or be hassled by the, the uh, privacy information, but uh, it is a big subject. I mean, Esther, you probably have some things to say about it as well. I get to talk about privacy just about every single day. Uh, <laughs> I, I will comment really specifically on the idea of contact tracing since that was brought up in the question. And traditional contact tracing is an epidemiological method for understanding person to person to person uh, exposure when you find somebody who's had an illness. And is usually included only in terms of place names, like, oh, I was at the convention center. 
Um, it's not, it, people don't record in traditional contact tracing XY coordinates. And I think one of the big questions before us, and uh, maybe this is, is something that all of you will do as you write your stories and think about this, is do we need to change the conversation about what contact tracing is? Is it useful to connect a person's exposures to a place? And uh, how do we do that safely so that then we can go back and do things like notify other contacts, but maybe it's also sanitizing uh, areas where we've seen a lot of people are coming into contact with one another and passing on disease. So uh, the contact tracing uh, issue is interesting. And I'll also say, uh, Jack mentioned it, um, in terms of people are collecting that kind of private health related data, they're keeping it in their own system. They don't share it with us in our system. We don't, we don't touch that data. Yeah, in, in some ways it's been controversial because in the very beginning, I wanted to see dots on a map of every disease, every, every, um, every case. Nope, that's uh, HIPAA. Uh, cannot right. do that, cannot share personal data. It's $10,000 fine for every individual that's exposed on personal healthcare data. So we, we had to struggle with spatially aggregating the data. First they said, okay, you can see it at the county level. Well, county level is not good enough. Not useful. So spatial relationships. So we've been, this is sort of a, we needed to drive it to census tracts and zip codes so we can really see patterns and relationships. Um, and that's gotten better, but the health people resisted that. So there was little soap operas going on uh, in different <laughs> states. Uh, I'll leave them nameless. Uh, to get these cultures, the, you know, the, it's just, for those of you who are story writers, this would be a gold mine for story writing because it's like little soap operas happening inside of state agencies or city agencies. Well, I can't share that data. Well, you know, it's like back and forth. It's important that they share the data at some level. So we've been, I think, done. A, finally, the end result is we got to a level of, of specificity where it's acceptable to everybody. Yeah, there's levels of, of uh, de-identification that don't require even aggregation. Uh, you can do things like geomask, which is moving a particular point in a random direction, a random distance, but still preserving spatial patterns relative to all of the other points you're dealing with. That's called geomasking. We mm -hmm. have ways of manipulating the latitude and longitude uh, so that you sort of aggregate but stack your points in a, in a different way. So there are methods where we don't have to do county level um, reporting because like Jack said, it's, it's not very useful for um, surfacing uh, disparities and problems that we really need to address. Let's ask, ask some more questions. Yeah, so um, you, you had mentioned uh, the uh, you'd mentioned the United States and China as some of the areas you've worked with. I'm wondering how your data toolbox might change what what different information you might get when you go to a place like Africa or South America. Well, I think our tools don't change much. You know, the way we work it is we have a generic set of tools and then we have applications that we build on top of those tools. And uh, in this case, in disasters of all types, we make both available for free around the world. So those generic tools, as well as the applications, which are the analytics and the visualization of the maps uh, have been uh, disseminated broadly. We have two partnerships, one with FEMA here in the United States where all FEMA partners, which are basically all cities, counties, uh, and all uh, tribes and so on, uh, get, get our software and they can get the data from FEMA as well as their local data and they use it as a toolbox to integrate. Outside the US, our partner is WHO, World Health Organization. And they're the, the, the head of the whole organization uh, who's, who's pretty darn good, by the way, uh, has met with us on numerous occasions and gone out with their member countries to allocate our tools to stand up in ministries of health, the same tools and the same apps, but with the local data. Now, these countries are not just impoverished in some cases in Africa and, and South Asia, but they also are impoverished with respect to data. <laughs> so it's hard to get the full value out of our tools. But some of our tools actually allow you to collect data. Survey123 is a device thing. 
where people can collect observational data in the field and immediately it goes to the cloud, drops onto a map, and other people can see it on a dashboard in real time. And that's one of the, one of the things that uh, has really been remarkable in this event as opposed to Ebola. We had a, a several day cycle in Ebola when West Africa events were occurring, observation data would have to be sent and then they could see it in uh, Geneva and respond effectively. Their dashboards were several days late. Right now, it's compressing down to getting, I wouldn't say real time, but 10, 15 minutes from observation in nursing home to understanding at the larger level. And I'm not saying we, we see that uniformly across the world, but, we, but the technology allows it. It really is the, the, the local policies, the local people that uh, wake up and, and are, are, are strong enough to really realize those applications, those kind of architectures, I mean. So as, as you look uh, at various maps that, that you're creating, if you had the proverbial magic wand, would you say there are ways that you'd like to see resources allocated differently? Are there sort of some success stories or maybe some not so successful stories that you could relay? Well, we're tool builders. We're mere tool builders and supporters of others who do the analytics and the policy making based on the analytics. It's, it's uh, and, and we understand our role. I mean, we're humbled by the kind of decisions that people get made, uh, that people make with our tools, but it's, uh, we, we sort of stay, we stay under the radar about decision making about the maps. Look, I, I am amazed and humbled by the volume of maps and the fact that people are modeling and driving their policies based on geographic information. That's amazing. And uh, right now, uh, people are interested in the economy. So they're looking at small businesses. Just imagine a map of California with lots of little dots on it. And uh, these dots are small businesses, let's say uh, less, than, uh, less than 100 employees. And then you overlay those dots on top of vulnerable neighborhoods and vulnerable economies. So the governor here is very interested in trying to figure out where to target um, relief funds or assistance programs. So we're gonna be moving from not just focused on the, the disease to the idea of focused on, on, on targeting vulnerable populations, yes, but vulnerable businesses. And that's also a geographic thing. So how did a landscape architect and a physician end uh, in this line of work? You first, Testy. Okay, well, for me, I was, uh, I started medical school and after about a year, I got a little bit bored, not because it was easy. Uh, it wasn't that, it just might not have been the perfect fit for me. And so I started getting interested in health informatics. Uh, so I it got the computer juices flowing. And uh, I finished medical school, got my master's degree in informatics. And then I started, uh, after my internship and residency, uh, a program in public health. And I had a single lecture in my first summer in that program on GIS. And I was a visual person. I saw it right away. And so I shifted all of my research efforts to be focused on spatial epidemiology. I started teaching it. I got an associate's degree in GIS, and uh, then I started using it in uh, my academic career, then in my public health career, and then uh, Jack asked me if I'd like to take it to the global level. Which she's done amazingly. Uh, I mean, I was a landscape architecture student uh, at Harvard where they were inventing some of the first computer map making tools, and I lucked out. I got a neat job there and just fell in love with it. Just like SD, you sort of see it and the light goes on and wow, it's fun. So I never looked back. Uh, I sort of shifted my career, but landscape planning and city planning and geographic studies were my respective degrees. And uh, they were a good foundation for geographic information systems. And uh, especially landscape planning the idea that you can bring all knowledge together and then make decisions from it uh, was was perfect. So I, I'm a perfect person for my job, I guess. 
I mean, and it's something I really love to do. So it's geographic planning or geo design or uh, geo strategies. And, and by the way, most of you do do geographic planning. You figure out where you want to live or uh, you landscape your home or you, uh, you know, you lay out a business strategy or you lay out a, a movie set geographically. Spatial thinking is inherent. My theory is in all of us. It's one of the strongest intellects that we have. So for me, my career has been about looking at different industries and bringing them together using location and geographic science as a foundation. In these last six weeks, I mean, I've always appreciated what, um, what SD has developed in the way of a, a whole business here, geomedicine is what I like to call it, but it's sort of all come home that the problem solving that she and her teams are doing, um, the diseases, uh, they're, they're sort of like, they're really showing the world through mapping that we're all interconnected. All people are interconnected. And they're not only just interconnected among each other, but they're also interconnected with nature. I mean, the crossover from, from another species into our species of this disease, for example, or the environments that we live in, vulnerable, vulnerable neighborhoods, whatever, however you want to organize your thinking on this. Uh, I think this disease will also send messages about approaching problem solving using geography, climate change, biodiversity, inequality, all the great challenges of the world that we're facing today can be uh, looked at through a lens of, of GIS and geographic thinking. GIS is really a metaphor, a technical way to describe digital geography. Um, and so I, I, think, I think as we move, um, I'll say it here for the first time, uh, I think that every organization in the world eventually will be using geographic information. I mean, Bill Gates said every, what did he say? He said something about every organization is going to have a laptop or every person will have a laptop or something like that. No, that was interesting. Uh, but here we're talking about a science. Every organization in the future will need to, will be using geographic science as a platform. So I'm not really interested in technology transformation, although people talk about that a lot. I'm interested in science transformation so that we spatially enable the way that people behave, take care of their place. And this, this I hope is appealing to you. It's not just, um, it's not just this particular pandemic. It's, it's everything that we're living in in this complex world today can be brought together and thought and analyzed and planned for using this, this powerful science. I want that science to show up in, in your work, <laughs> in storytelling, in, in creating futures that are not doom and gloom and going to hell all the time, but creating a sense of, of a story uh, where we can really bring it together through science and technology and create a better world. Well, we have, we have many more questions in the feed, but unfortunately that's all the time we have. I wanna thank you both for taking the time to speak with us today. And uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, at this point also, I'm gonna bring Anne back on the screen and, uh, and thank you both. Thank you. You know, this has been great. I think one of the things I, I, maybe I shouldn't even admit this, but I have worked at the National Academy of Sciences for 30 years. Um, I guess I, I need my diva light today. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I really like best about my job is the fact that um, I learn something almost every single day. Um, and I feel really privileged to, to be able to, to be part of an event like this where I learn so much every single time I hear from such incredibly smart people. So, so we really are incredibly um, uh, appreciative of the time that Jack and Esty took out of their day because I think that you can tell like so many people that are kind of sitting at the front lines um, in this, uh, as we keep referring to them at these unprecedented times, um, these are two people that have been insane busy. Um, so the fact that they took time out of they, their day to do this, um, we'll give another shout out to Davis Maston because he was instrumental in making this happen. So we want to thank them very much. Um, we also want to give a little bit of a tease to what we're doing next week. Um, next Wednesday, you know, it, it, <laughs> 
it's been interesting because um, we've been doing a lot of programming that are that's specific to to the um, to the pandemic. Uh, but we did one of our questions that we asked in the surveys that we circulated was, well, how much do you want to hear about non-pandemic related science? And and we did hear from you that you wanted to get some of that. So one of the people that we've been wanting to get on our stage for a long time um, is Kirk Johnson, who is the director of the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution. And of course, the Smithsonian um, is not open right now. Their, their physical doors are shut. And so I got to thinking, well, that must mean that Kirk is probably not quite as busy as he usually is, although he is still running a museum. Um, so he's not sitting around drumming his fingers. But it did mean that because we could ask him to do this from his home and not ask him to get on an airplane and make this a hard ask, that he, he is also making himself available to um, the exchange. So we're very pleased to have Kirk Johnson with us next week, and he's going to be talking about polar extremes. Um, he's a geologist, so we've got a little bit of a theme going here, um, and he's going to come and give us some non-COVID-related science programming for next Wednesday. So Rick and I will be back um, in our same location, uh, but we'll be bringing a new science guest to you, and we hope that you will join us. And thanks everybody, great questions this week. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but uh, you really, you were a great engaged audience. Thank you so much. I know you are clapping virtually, so thank you. <laughs> so stay safe, stay healthy, and stay in touch with us. If you have anything you need to give us some requests, we'll see what we can do. Bye.